We have Connor Walsh from Harvard University, and he's going to introduce his students. Thanks, Noah. Um, and thanks for the opportunity. And this uh, lab focus talk is an interesting model, and I, I think it's a nice way to kind of highlight some of the work that we're doing across a bunch of projects. I won't spend too long introducing things. Um, my name is Connor Walsh. I'm a faculty member at Harvard. And um, today we're going to have four kind of sub talks um, within our, our lab focus talk. The first one is going to be talking about our recent work on portable autonomous exosuits and reducing the metabolic cost of walking and running. Then we're also going to talk about co-adaptation of humans and robots, and, and Rich is going to talk about um, the uh, human side, and myung is going to talk about the robot side. Um, then we're also going to talk about some of the work that we're doing on the medical side, so using the same type of approach of a, a software-able robot to restore gait for people post-stroke. Um, and then at the end, that's going to be by Jehoon, and then at the end we're going to talk very briefly, just two one-minute talks, about some also new hardware developments that we're doing in this area too. So just as a little bit of an introduction, um, you can kind of see here some work from the past five or six years that our lab has been doing in the area of soft exosuits or soft wearable robots to try and augment human walking, so reducing the metabolic cost of walking. And we've been developing kind of from kind of more primitive to gradually more sophisticated systems in terms of hardware and controls and also human interfaces over the years. A lot of this has been guided by a lot of studies we've done in the lab with tethered-based systems. And so with these tethered systems, we vary the level of assistance, the timing of assistance, where we're applying assistance, at the hip or at the ankle or both, to try and see what seems to be the best way to help someone. And so I won't be able to go into detail on all of this, but Brendan, shout out, also has a cool poster. They're upstairs in the conference room if you want to check this out more, but we've been trying to look at our data as well as kind of more recent data collected by other groups um, to kind of update the augmentation factor that was developed by um, Luke, um, Elliot, and, and Hugh at MIT, but basically kind of really showing that if you add more power, whether it's at the ankle or the hip, um, you do see kind of more metabolic reductions. Um, but if you want to learn more about this, I would talk to Brendan. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to transition on to Nikos now, who's going to talk about some of our work um, on, on evaluating our autonomous systems over the last year or so. Thanks, Coro. Uh, yeah, as, uh, I will uh, give a high-level overview about um, our fully autonomous systems that we have developed um, uh, during the DARPA uh, WaterWeb program. In this picture, I'm wearing our latest uh, full suit prototype that uh, is a four degree of freedom system to assist uh, hip and ankle uh, during walking. The system consists of... Uh, oops, sorry. The system consists uh, of uh, portable cable-driven actuation, uh, soft textiles, wearable sensors integrated into the suit uh, components, uh, and uh, by inspired control algorithms. Um, our general uh, control approach uh, is uh, to use sensor information, and specifically IMUs, to detect um, certain gate events, and then based on these events, uh, the controller uh, generates a trajectory for the cable uh, by means of which we are able to control the, the force uh, that we want to apply to, to the user. We have been evaluating um, uh, the improvement in energetics uh, for the multi-joint suit uh, while wearing the multi-joint exosuit. Um, in our latest study, uh, we uh, uh, we uh, proposed a controller uh, that uh, auto-tunes the controller parameters uh, in order to maximize the mechanical deliver power uh, in, uh, uh, for each individual, resulting in 50% uh, uh, metabolic reduction um, uh, co when comparing the power condition to the uh, non-shoot condition. Uh, our team has also spent a lot of uh, uh, weeks in the Army Research Lab we're actually uh, testing uh, these devices in real scenarios with soldiers uh, and learning a lot of lessons. Uh, in a country course like that, uh, the system needs to uh, provide the systems, but only when needed. Uh, for instance, when uh, the soldier uh, co goes over an obstacle, the system has to be completely transparent. And this is easy to achieve, inherently easy to achieve with uh, an exosuit, whereas a rigid co uh, exoskeleton will have to work, uh, to, to do additional work in order to, to be completely transparent. We have uh, also interesting in running augmentation. Um, we wanted to develop an autonomous system uh, to uh, assist, uh, to, to improve energetic uh, during walking and running. 
we initially start uh, investigated hip extension uh, and one uh, assistance and uh, one of the main reason was that uh, with this hip system we were able to uh, um, concentrate the the, the main uh, the big portion of the the mass uh, on the center of, close to the center of mass and have very low distal uh, added mass on the lower extremity in order to reduce the to minimize the metabolic penalty of the uh, of the of the system uh, in treadmill studies we have uh, found that uh, optimal profiles are different when you're looking into walking and running so when you want to go uh, your system wants to go over ground you need to have a detection algorithm that detects the walking and running uh, online we know from our uh, biomechanics that uh, the energy uh, the potential energy during stance uh, is out of phase when you're looking walking and running so inspired by this uh, principle we used um, acceleration measurements from the abandon imu abdomen imu uh, in order to use it as a proxy measure uh, for referring for um, uh, uh, um <coughs> sorry for using it uh, in order to uh, to refer ab to refer about the potential energy uh, and using uh, a heuristic ruler based uh, classifier we are able to detect uh, in a step by step basis walking and running i will uh, not go more into details on this but there is a, a ICRA paper in presenting this week about the, this algorithm if people want to know more about accuracy and the results i'm happy to send it over um, during our evaluation studies uh, for this uh, hip system we uh, have shown uh, uh, signi statistical significant uh, results in metabolic reduction for running 5% about an average of 5% and walking of 8%. Uh, These are exciting results uh, give, considering the fa uh, fact that we are assisting HIP uh, unilaterally and uh, with moderate, uh, moderate level of forces. And now we'll uh, pass the microphone to, to Chris to keep going on the discussion. Great. Th Hello. Great. Thanks, Nikos. Um, so as Nikos described, we can get pretty good metabolic benefit from these soft exosuits, but you know, going forward, we really want to understand how we can do better. And so we think the important way that we can do that, or the way that we should be doing that, is trying to understand the co-adaptation between the human and the robot. Uh, so first, I'll be talking about how the human adapts to the exosuit, and then myung Ki will be talking more about the robot and how we can optimize the controller. Uh, and, and as we understand these independently or separately, um, we think that we'll better understand how they interact um, going forward. So as most people who have worked with exoskeletons know, uh, you get variable response among individuals. So with this passive device here, uh, we have different individuals in different conditions. And shown in green are conditions where we got good metabolic response, so metabolics went down. And the red is where we get poor metabolic response, so metabolics went up. Um, we also see, so this is with a passive device, and we also see that in active systems where, although we get metabolic benefit in each of these cases, there's still a lot of variability where uh, this person only has 2%, uh, this person has 20%. So how can we get this variability down so that we can get optimal um, improvement across individuals? So the way we're thinking about doing this from the human perspective is this training protocol. Uh, where we apply fixed assistance profiles to naive individuals. Uh, and I would encourage you to go to Krithika's poster. Uh, I think it's on the second floor, hidden in a conference room. So try to find it. Um, but with this training protocol, we really hope to find individuals who respond across a continuum. Uh, so you know, for probably one of the first times uh, with exosuits, uh, we're trying to find individuals that actually don't respond well to assistance. And so as we, um, and once we, we find these individuals, we can, uh, apply a standard biomechanics toolbox to try to understand how and why they're adapting. So we have metabolic cost, uh, some of the standard techniques of uh, motion capture inverse dynamics, and then finally EMG. And another metric that we're adding, uh, some work that I did as part of my PhD and I'm continuing, is looking at ultrasound. So how can we understand what the muscle fascicles are doing uh, when we apply assistance? And so we start with the assumption that uh, healthy individuals are you know, fairly efficient in walking, and then we can hypothesize that the optimal contraction profile during the, the active condition uh, will match what the tuned natural or unperturbed state is. Uh, so 
for some of you who are not as familiar with ultrasound, uh, this is kind of what it looks like where we can place a ultrasound probe over top of the calf muscle, and then we get this B mode image, which is shown here on the left. So to the left is the ankle, we have the skin surface, and then we can, in post-processing, track uh, a muscle fascicle. And so what this looks like, and this is slowed down, um, if it'll play. Um, so over a gait cycle, we can get this um, you know, so, sort of isometric and then a shortening cycle uh, of the muscle fascicles. And so this is without assistance, and then when we apply assistance, let's see if I can get this to go. Uh, we can look and see how the muscle fascicles change as we uh, apply active assistance to the human. Uh, so getting to the results, um, so I'm showing uh, data from two subjects here, one who is a low responder, one is a high responder. And what we find is that the high responder has these uh, you know, traditional metrics that we consider good for um, energetic. So uh, increased ankle moment and power, uh, reduced activation, and we also see that the, the muscle fascicles uh, for the person that responded well is correlated much better with the, um, with the, um, the natural or the unperturbed state. Uh, so we think going forward that we can use some of this knowledge to better uh, design exoskeletons. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop and allow Myung Hee to talk about how we can optimize uh, the robots. So um, now I focus on the um, um, robot adaptation part. Um, here um, I talk about how we optimize our stance for each individual. This uh, study was motivated, motivated by the fact that the response curve for each individual look, seems to be different for um, different person. For example, the optimal uh, stance for uh, response curve for the person A seems to be different from the optimal response curve for the person B. It, it, it means that um, the individualized assistance uh, may maximize the metabolic benefit, and which suggests that it's better to tune the control parameters to maximize the benefit. So, um, so we are automating the tuning process using human in the low optimization. This is a collaborative work with the um, Scott Quindersmith group. Uh, here, more specifically, we um, individualized hip resistance, um, by, which is parameterized by peak and offset timing. So um, we applied the uh, assistance uh, while directly minimizing metabolic cost during human working. And the, measuring the metabolic cost uh, poses several challenges due to its slow and noisy metabolics. Um, which uh, one of the challenges is that it fundamentally limits the number of uh, iterations. Therefore, uh, we uh, employed the sample efficient and noise tolerant met um, optimization method, which is based on optimization. So major optimization uh, first is to match the metabolic landscape uh, of the peak and offset timing, and they select the best possible parameter, and we provide the assistance to each individual, and we repeated this process for 20 iterations. And by um, assisting HIP only by individualizing the assistance, seven participants reduced metabolic cost by 17% compared to no suit condition. And this great metabolic reduction seems to be caused by the customizing assistance. This graph shows the metabolic, uh, me, um, first of all, does profile for three different subjects. And as you can see here, the first profile for three subjects was very different for each individual. And also, this uh, different profile was uh, found within 25 minutes for uh, all subjects. So motivated by these results, now we are trying to um, individualize multi-joint assistance. This device, now we can provide um, several different hip and ankle assistance conditions and which means that we can further um, reduce metabolic cost during working. But also, this suggests that we have more parameters to optimize, and it's better, so therefore, we need to be more sample efficient. So we used a bending method with the metabolic cost estimation method. So 
basically, um, previously we used full two minutes to get one est metabolic estimation. But if the metabolic cost seems to be higher than previous observations, we just stop early and move on to the next uh, conditions. Therefore, you can save more time, and therefore we have more iterations. So our pilot study um, shows that um, we were able to identify the optimal parameters within one hour for four to six parameter optimization. So with that, um, I pass on to the medical side by Jaehyun. All right, so I will switch gears to talk about our clinical application of soft dextrosuit for post-stroke patients. Stroke is a leading cause of long-term disability that affects 7.2 million in Americans alone. Uh, of those people, 80% report locomotor impairment. Uh, uh, one of the major contributors of the locomotor impairment after stroke is impaired paratic ankle function. We developed soft exercise to assist with paratic ankle function in walking after stroke. Uh, particularly, this soft exercise should assist with paratic ankle plantar flexion to improve paratic uh, forward proportion and uh, assist with dorsiflexion to improve toe clearance and swing. Two years ago in dynamic walking, we presented uh, our preliminary research from a tre uh, tre treadmill study with a tethered exosuit that's shown on the left. And today I will summarize the key findings from the, uh, the treadmill study and then I will discuss our portable, new portable autonomous uh, soft exosuit uh, to assist with the overground walking. In the treadmill study, we compared uh, walking with wearing exosuit powered to ex wearing exosuit unpowered. Uh, what we found is that patient could improve ground clearance and also could improve pr uh, proportion symmetry. Not only that, they could improve their walking economy while reducing their compensation walking pattern, uh, such as like uh, foot circumduction or hip hiking. And we've investigated biomechanical mechanism underlying this metabolic cost reduction. We calculated body center mass power generated uh, for step-to-step -step transition by paratic side and the non-paratic side to the limb. We found that they, uh, they, could, uh, they could improve their walk, uh, body center mass power generation symmetry between paratic side and non-paratic side to the limb. And more importantly, the change in the non paratic side uh, body center mass power generation for step-to-step -step transition was uh, correlated with the metabolic post power reduction. So all of this, uh, all of this research are exciting, but the tether system is uh, limited to the uh, treadmill walking. So we developed a new autonomous soft exercise for the overground walking study. So this uh, system is uh, less than four kilograms. We greatly simplify the structure to use in the clinics, and we, it, we try to make it more uh, to, re to uh, consume the power as less as possible. To validate the system, we uh, do the overground walking study. We recruited 11 patients, and we compared overground walking with exosuit power to exosuit uh, 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 and to without wearing exosuit. The research was similar to the treadmill walking, so we could see the improved toe clearance in swing, and also we improved paratic forward proportion. We are still analyzing this data, so we, we hope to present this data to, in the next year's dynamic walking. So I'll give to Evelyn to talk about our new hardware. Um, so in addition to soft exosuits, we're also exploring um, different mechanisms that um, enable us to apply kind of targeted bursts of um, assistance as needed while still, um, while being able to um, switch to being transparent to the user and um, not impeding their motion for the remainder of the gait cycle. So here we have um, this um, body mounted mechanism which uh, can apply bidirectional assistance to a joint um, uh, using a single um, offboard motor, but can become mechanically transparent to the user at any time. So the way it works is, uh, um, we have this bounding cable driven pulley and it, it, with two protrusions coming off the face and in the middle is a shaft that's um, 
shaft that's coupled to the thigh of the user. And by controlling uh, the relative position of the pulley to the thigh shaft, we can control their engagement and whether we apply assistance or we can, um, Well, sorry. Um, or whether we, we can purposely um, maintain a gap between the two and purposely avoid engaging the thigh shaft um, in order to um, apply uh, zero force. Um, so basically what we're doing is we are purposely putting um, backlash into the system so that um, instead of needing to use kind of zero force control which has higher system requirements, um, we can kind of use, uh, achieve transparency using this simple um, position control and um, get this kind of clutching functionality without needing an extra actuator. So um, we prototype this and um, uh, we uh, interface it to the body with a semi rigid waist belt and a thigh cuff and you can see that uh, we can apply these time bursts of torque to the hip um, as needed. Oh. And next, uh, next I'll pass it off to Jin Wan. And I want to introduce our new ankle assist de device that is using pneumatic power source. Oh. And this device is uh, a software robot that is composed of the textile inflatable actuator here, IMU new sensor, and custom made a textile boot integrated design. And this device is uh, designed to generate more than 20 Newton meter and during walking to potentially reduce the metabolic cost during walking. And we did, we conducted static torque measurement and we found out uh, maximum torque 39 Newton meter with 70 PSI air pressure supply. And as you can see here, this device is very compact and flexible and very easy to put on and put off. Uh, thanks to its integrated design. And also it generates uh, torque and assist ankle plantar flexion when pressurizing the actuator. And we also conducted a human subject test. And Maybe we can show the video yep. The All right. Thank you very much. How do you envision it being used in a in like a practical application? Would it be only in a rehab tethered application, or could you walk around with it? So at, at this stage, we think uh, making the mobile pneumatic system is quite difficult. So maybe we can envision it for the rehabilitation, or it can be used in the industrial setting, and in, not for the walking, but for other like industrial like lifting or other application. But in the future, if mobile pneumatic system is developed in, our, in other group, maybe we can have a mobile system with pneumatic power supply. How do people feel about the noise? Yeah, no, it is a little bit noisy than like just bought, bought and cable system. I should admit that. But usually people don't care too much about the noise, I, I would say. Yeah. Um, so uh, the human loop optimization stuff, do, do you see much learning by people going on at the same time? Uh, um, like the people learning at the same time as your optimization algorithms are learning? So I think that people also learn. So in people learn, the, the, there's a learning part differently, but we minimize the learning part by recruiting only experienced subject for the experiment we did. But we also we are also doing the multi-joint optimization right now. And it seems like there's a big learning part as well as we saw more metabolic reduction as the time goes. But it seems like so even though you recruit experienced people, yeah. they're not experienced with all the controllers you give them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it it seems like they're gonna like for every new controller you give them, there's oh, there's yeah. there's a period of undefined amount of time where they're gonna yeah. adjust their their own control. Yeah, to, yeah. And, and I'm wondering, do you see that? Do you see that as a problem? So, um, 
So it was hard to see, like when I look at the graph, so we collect only metabolic cost, which is slow, so it was very hard to see using metabolic cost. But so we also collected the uh, ground reaction force. So I was wondering if there's anything I can see using ground reaction force, but I was not able to see any distinctive measure of the um, adaptation parts. So there was also user's feedback that he can kind of adapt very quickly after 10 seconds. So for the experiment to be conducted, uh, for at least for the experienced subjects, there's a learning part, but it seems like the learning part is maybe less than 30 seconds or so, just ballpark. Oh, I, I try to remember. Um, I think that the breath is 100 hertz. Oh, 100 hertz, I would say the IMU sensors. Okay. Yeah. Hi, um, so this question is more regarding the uh, clinical applications for the soft exoskeletons. So I was, uh, in my experience working with clinicians and with the stroke population, a large problem right now with assistive technology is very limited compliance. So these simple ankle fluorothoses aren't being used. And I was just wondering how your soft, uh, like what uh, design considerations and stuff you have done to help increase compliance and like what are the trade-offs like obviously a softer device would be more comfortable but you have this onboard power or whatever power. so yeah just in terms so of yeah that's like if you see our like autonomous exercise like we really try to make it simple to uh, for clinicians to uh, uh, use it in the clinics so uh, we simplify so that it can be done in four minutes and it has like a little padding inside, so it's comfortable and it can be uh, worn in different sizes. So we have four sizes. We used to have 12 sizes and we reduced the number of sizes to four sizes so that it could to reduce the complexity. And on the other hand, the actuator itself, um, yeah, but like make it simple. I'll just add one thing to that. that I, I think it's a challenge, right? You're competing with a plastic brace that a person can, can put on in, in one minute and, you know, are really, really cheap. So I think, you know, we're, you know, interested in thinking about using this in, in a rehabilitation setting, you know, initially to maybe help people learn how to get better. But competing with plastic simple braces that help people walk is hard when you think about robots. Okay, three second question, 10 second answer, go. <laughs> so in, in the adaptation stuff, you saw that the muscle fascicle lengths and stuff are correlated with normal walking. But all this is, I mean, length, force, velocity, all that is activation dependent. So why do you see that it's proportional? And while you're answering that, the next speaker can stand up. I think a lot of what we're focusing on is more the contraction timing, so that we're applying assistance at the same time that the muscle is contracting, so that we're not, you know, exchanging energy between the muscle and the tendon, and we're also not trying to redirect the center of mass at the wrong time. Um, so there could be some force velocity you know, component that we're not um, taking into account. Um, and you know, from looking at the absolute links, which I didn't show it. Oh, nope. Okay, okay. <laughs>